Welcome to this People and Purpose video. I am Esther Molnar Mills and it is my absolute privilege to today introduce to you Bumi Token, who is a business advisor, business growth specialist and teacher. Welcome, Bumi. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Um, it's, it's great that you've agreed to speak to the, the readers and viewers of, of People and Purpose. Before we go into some of the key aspects of business planning and business growth that I know you specialize in, could you just um, give us a little bit of background about yourself? Tell us a bit about your work. My main dream and desire and passion is to help people to achieve their own dream of starting and owning a successful business. And that's what drives me to do everything that I engage myself into. So I provide people with the necessary skills and knowledge to help them to run, to start businesses and run better businesses. So sometimes this journey can be a short one, but most of the time it tends to be a longer journey, a longer process to actually get people to do this. Um, my own experience comes from having run many types of businesses. I mean, when I was doing that, I thought it seemed a little bit crazy. I mean, I've done, I've supplied leather jackets to Harvey Nichols, to Next. I, I've done property business, I've done music business. There was a time I was trading on the streets selling T-shirts and sunglasses in the summer. Um, I've had a couple of record shops back in the 90s. So I've done quite a lot of things. Um, so those kind of experiences brought me to the place where someone requested that I came to give a lecture one day on music business. And they were really, really blessed by the things I said and shared with them that I was told to now, you know, um, run other courses in music. Then I went on to run courses in general business. Then I was uh, employed at Portobello Business Center, which is a business startup development, government-owned business startup development agency. I right. worked there for about 10 years. At the same time, I was lecturing on business planning at City University in London. So those experiences brought me into the place where I became an advisor to start up and growing businesses. Wow, that's an incredible range of experiences. <laughs> Distilling some of the key, um, key issues that you've identified mm -hmm. through your time both in business and then helping others start and build their own businesses. Mm -hmm. What would you say are some of the key challenges that people experience around business growth or yeah. particularly business planning? Okay. I think the first area is the mindset. Right. There is a mindset for success and there is a mindset for failure. And it will amaze you that in the world that we live in right now, where everybody wants to get to the top very quickly, that doesn't really work in business. If you think about a lot of successful business owners today, like your Richard Branson's mm. and your you know, uh, 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 many people like him, you will understand how long it has taken them to actually be at the place that they are. Well, a lot of people have the mindset of doing things very quickly and ignoring the growth or growing curve or the learning curve. You cannot bypass the learning curve and think you're going to be successful. Well, you can be successful for a while, but then you might drop. So you want to kind of plan for the long term. And that's, uh, that's a word that people shy away from. Everybody wants to do things in the microwave, short-term uh, uh, situation. So that's the first thing, the mindset. Have a long-range mindset. The second thing is finding a system that works. And when you think about maybe perhaps a business model, which needs to account for your target group, the kind of product you, you're creating, or the kind of problems you're solving, the partners you need to have, all those kind of things take that's what makes a system, that's what makes a business model to, to function well. And, mm -hmm. it, and it takes a while to actually arrive at that place. And if you don't have a good system that works, the business is going to grow very slowly or it's going to really struggle. So you need a good system around you. And that system will include people, resources, and all the other things that makes a system work. And the final area that I think is very crucial is to find and keep on finding and keeping targeted customers. Right. Targeted customers are the people who are going to sustain your business over the long term. 
So we need to be thinking about, instead of selling one product to one customer, we're thinking about what's the lifetime value of a particular customer to us? And how do we make sure we attract that customer or client and keep them? Those three things are very important. The mindset, the system, and targeted customers. Mm -hmm. So I might be putting you on the spot here a little bit. Um, but, but from your experience in working with other businesses, or in fact from one of your own businesses, do you have a case study that you would be able to share with us that sort of illustrates how these three things come together or how you might work with someone to develop um, their mindset, their systems, and their customer acquisition? Yeah, there's years. an example that, that, that comes to mind right now mm -hmm. that um, actually involves some failure and success. Right. Um, I helped a particular friend of mine to create uh, a, a, a boutique um, selling fashion, uh, high fashion wear to um, quite well-off or affluent type of clientele. Mm -hmm. And the shop, we had, we had a physical location at the time. And that physical location attracted people. And she was doing quite well. But she needed more customers. And she had, a, she had the product. She had, and she, but, but she didn't have the mindset of actually right. going out and getting the customers. Now that she have the mindset, uh, or now that she have the desire to go out and sell, even though she had a good system. And that business just collapsed after a while because she wasn't right. getting enough sales. But, but you've got to think about it this way. She's the kind of person that would go down the road in a particular attire and everybody would be asking her, wow, where did you get this? This looks really good. But she doesn't have the mindset to convert those inquiries into sales. Because a lot of people think, when they talk about sales, when people think about sales, the think about a hard no salesman knocking down your door, trying to force you to buy something. But clients were actually coming to her, but her mindset wasn't good enough to translate that and transform that into actual sales. So, well, this is now years ago. Recently, she's picked up that idea again. And now we're learning from the beginning. Mm -hmm. We start with how do you feel about yourself? How do you feel about where you're going? What kind of goals do you have? And how are you pursuing your goals? How do you develop discipline? And with those kind of tools being used with her, she's going to now do that business from home and be even more successful than when she had a shop because the missing links are now in place for her. That's fascinating to think that actually it's not about the, the sort of hard business aspects as much as it is about the mindset. Yeah. That's very interesting to, to hear. Um, so if, if, um, if you're advising someone who's about to start a new business, is that where you suggest they start with the mindset? Yeah, because, because the mindset also includes things like, what are you good at? A lot right. of people, you know, I always say there are two, two routes to business. One is to find an opportunity and exploit it. The second is to have a passion that you can take to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Now, when a lot of people think about starting a business, they tend to look at finding an opportunity. That's good, but that requires a much more disciplined person. Somebody who's extremely entrepreneurial, risk-taking, that can drive that kind of business. For example, if you have a passion to sing or to make books or to write books, that's a passion you can take to the marketplace. Why leave that and go do an internet business? So that's where you start. That's, a, that's the mindset, the kind of mindset I'm talking about. You've got to have a mindset that makes you comfortable with what you have and who you are. So that's the beginning. Mm -hmm. Choose a business that fits with your personality, your desires, your dreams, and your passion. Because the, the interesting thing about business is that we all come to a point in business where things are difficult. Now, if you don't have the passion, the desire, the drive, and the fortitude 
and the perseverance to continue, you're going to just give up and stop and go do something else. So um, that happens to me many times. That's how I know. And it's still <laughs> happening to people. So, right. But you, you're going to find something you really like and kind of go for it. Or if you're going to find an opportunity, then that's good too. But make sure you are the type of person that can actually work an opportunity and make it successful. So that's the beginning. That's what you, you start from. So is, if um, we have someone who's currently employed in, in a corporate role okay. and they're thinking about starting a business, is that what you would advise them to start with, something that they're passionate about? Absolutely. Right. Ab absolutely, yes. And the other thing about for, for the corporate, mind, corporate worker or corporate manager going to start a business is that they, they need to understand one thing, which is really important. Having a startup business is not the same as running a small corporation. What, what do I mean by that? Somebody who works for Shell or mm -hmm. BT or, you know, some big company wants to start a business and they think that their startup is going to just be a mini Asda or a mini Tesco. <laughs> it's not going to work like that. That's not a startup. A startup is actually a business that is still looking for uh, the, the best business model that's going to work. So at that stage, you cannot afford all the systems that surround an established business. Right. Like they don't have a sales department, a marketing department, a finance department. And, you know, but you don't have all that. In fact, you are the finance person, you are the marketing <laughs> person, and, and you are everything as far as the business is concerned. So you have to structure yourself and bootstrap yourself in such a way that you don't run out of money. I think something else that is important for this type of person. I, I knew of a lady who started a business and she spent 45,000 pounds. And this is, this is true. <laughs> she spent 40, 45,000 pounds and had only made 20 pounds worth of sales. Wow. But she has spent 45 grand. I mean, that's insane. You just never do that. Because she followed the corporate model type of, uh, 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 of, of system, of business. Right. But you, you shouldn't do that as a, as, a, as a startup because you don't have endless pockets. So is that one of the one of the key mistakes you say is is just thinking of a startup as if it were a, a corporate entity? That's it. A smaller version, a right. smaller corporate entity, which is absolutely not. That's a that's a major problem. And another another difficulty for a uh, for for somebody we just mentioned, a corporate manager, is they need to understand that they have peculiar situations and peculiar circumstances that they should use to start their own business. So what I mean by that is this. When I think about ideas from maybe other business owners, mm -hmm. I've got to take those ideas, bring it into my mind, use it to think about where I am, what opportunities are open to me, what kind of passion I have, and then bring all that into the mix before I create my own strategies. I'm not supposed to just take somebody else's strategy and just use it because okay. that belongs to someone else. It's not, it does, it's not peculiar to me because it's what's peculiar to me that is going to work in the long term. So where would you suggest a business owner starts? So whether they're, they're new to just setting up a startup, regardless of their background, or whether they've arrived at a point where they've got something small and stable that they're looking to grow, what would you be suggesting to them in terms of their first steps for business planning? Okay. You, you, are, you, you brought in two elements. Is, are you talking about, should we, should we look at a startup or somebody who has who is already started in business and wants to grow their business. Which one do you want to do? First? Let's look at each of them separately. Is that okay? Oh, okay so okay. shall I ask you the question again and I can cut that bit out? Oh. Um, <laughs> so based on what you've just described, what would you suggest as the first steps for someone who is just starting up a business? 
okay. regardless of their background? What might be their first steps or considerations when it comes to business planning and planning for long-term growth? Hi. Excellent. That's a very good question that needs, it can be a long answer, but I'm going to give you a short one. <laughs> the first thing somebody needs to do is to just start. By, by saying that, I mean, that sounds very odd. I want to start a business. Yeah, okay, just start. Start doing what? Start taking your, the first step towards starting a business. It will amaze you how many people talk about starting a business, but do not actually start. Right. By start, I mean take a step of writing down your idea, make a step of attending a seminar, make a step of reading a book, make a step of uh, go talk to somebody. That's, just make a step towards that because you're developing a habit that's going to sustain you in the long term. The second thing that somebody starting a business needs to do is to decide on the niche they're going to sell to and the problems they're going to solve. So those two things have to work hand in hand. You've got to think about the niche. Say I'm selling sunglasses. Now, we know that maybe perhaps 40% of the population, or maybe 30% of the population has a pair of sunglasses in their house. But the, the fact is, not everybody will buy your sunglasses. So you've got to have a targeted group that you want to start with. Another reason why you need a niche, which is a small group that you want to sell to, is because you don't have the resources to market to a mass audience. So you start with a small group. Talk to that small group. Figure out what problems they have that you can solve. Somebody says, a problem worth solving. So you think about that, those problems that you're going to solve. And then the third thing to do is to test your ideas. By developing a prototype or coming up with um, maybe a, a smaller version of what you might sell and go and talk to that niche to let them critique your product, come back, develop that product, and then bring it back into the market. The days of working in your garage in secret, I think those days are over. I think you have to develop your product with your ideal customer as you're going along in your business. Mm -hmm. So once you've done that, you now move to the next stage of making some sales. Now, this is a game changer for any business. Generating sales no matter how small or large those sales may be, in the beginning of your business is so crucial. Number one, it tells you that you actually have a business that's going to make money. Yeah, it's that proof of concept piece, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, goodness. That gives you the confidence that you need. Yeah. If you're going to raise money, there's nothing that persuades investors, either large or small, that your business will work than to say that I've sold 10 I've sold 15, I've sold 1,000, I've sold 10,000. That, that's the proof. You need some sales. And you're only going to be able to generate those levels of sales if you have a niche that you're working with. So you've tested, you've generated some sales. The next thing is you will learn, you will have learned, is to look at your competitors. What are, what are my competitors doing? What can I learn from them? How are they selling? How are they marketing? Okay, what can, I, what can I input from all their efforts into my business and kind of make it work in a better way for me? So then I'm going to... Now, once I've researched my competitors, I will look at a competitor that is 20 years ahead of me and one that is five years ahead of me and one that is two years ahead of me. And I'll use those three as my benchmark to decide what I should be doing. Nice. So in addition to speaking to my niche, looking at my customers, getting feedback from my product, I'm now able to market to a larger group or a group beyond my small niche. Mm -hmm. But my small niche or my small group of clients are so important in the beginning that you cannot deal without them. So that's how you grow and expand and move forward. 
Excellent. And there's some really, really um, thought provoking insights in there, I think, that we sometimes underestimate. I love this idea of just, just, just starting, but then starting with the, with the customer in mind the whole time. Um, so how would this be different for someone who already has an existing business and is now looking to make it more sustainable or to, or to accelerate growth? Yeah. What would your advice be to someone in that position? Okay. Somebody who, who, who already has a business should already have some clients. So they need to go back and, you know, talk to their clients a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Sometimes as entrepreneurs, we don't talk to our clients enough. So what tends to happen is that um, we could be selling more to our clients but we're too busy chasing new clients. Actually, right. it costs more money to sell to, uh, it costs more money to get new clients than it costs to actually get, to actually sell more to your existing clients. It's easier to sell to your existing clients than it is to, to sell to your new client anyway. Sure. So somebody who wants to grow their business is to find out, I mean, you can grow your business in three ways. I mean, somebody says you can grow your business by, you know, introducing more products, mm -hmm. uh, selling at a higher value, because most businesses are selling at a lower value, and then selling more frequently. So selling more products, selling at a higher value, mm -hmm. and selling more frequently. If you think about those three things, that's going to help your growth. But that growth is only going to come because you've had some feedback from your existing clients. Even to get other clients, you need to talk to your existing clients to know why they're actually purchasing your product. Sometimes people don't even talk to their clients at all. For example, I'll give you an example of a small business, a small mm -hmm. business. Like uh, I go to my MOT guy to do my car once a year. He doesn't call me to say oh, your MOT is due. It doesn't. It doesn't have a subscription model, which it could have, which it could. It could commit me to a co subscription model, which I'll pay. He doesn't do that, so mm -hmm. I may just choose to go down the road and not go back to him. And he might sit there and complain that oh, he's losing business. His business is not growing, but he's not even asking me to refer to his business, my mm -hmm. friends who drive. Right. Because referral is another way that an existing business can grow, and a new business too, but referral is really crucial to an existing business who wants to grow. Then you need a plan of action for your growth. So I will talk to your existing clients, thinking about what products they want, how frequently they use the products that you're selling, and you know, whether if you increase your value, they will still purchase, then you can create a plan, a business plan that you can use to raise funds to scale up. But you don't have anything to scale up on if you've not talked to your clients mm -hmm. and determine what or which of the three areas or all the three areas you're going to pursue, either to sell more, to, to, to create more products. What products am I going to create? What are you going to talk to your customers to know what they want, you know, to, to increase your value and to sell more frequently. So it sounds like what you're saying is that across the board, when it comes to business planning and growth, this yeah. idea of proximity to the customer, understanding your place in the market yeah. and really getting what your customers liked and what they want more of um, is, is, is really the way forward, isn't it? Extre extremely important. Yeah. So that chimes with the third of the two of the um, three areas that you've mentioned at the start of of mindset, which we've talked about a little bit. Um, this piece about targeted customers, and then um, mm. and then systems. So, um, would you be able to just share just a couple of thoughts about the types of systems that small businesses need to um, concentrate on? Yeah, so a, a small business can concentrate on how do they keep. What system do they have in place to keep existing customers? Mm -hmm. Because if it, like the one I explained about the MOT guy, the mechanic, he doesn't have a system right. for keeping customers. He doesn't have anything. He just anticipates and expects customers will keep coming back to him without understanding the uh, competition that is out there, 
when it actually comes to doing the MOT because, you know, and if a customer is very price sensitive, they're going to just go down the road. They need a, a system to keep customers. They also need, very, very importantly, a referral system. Mm -hmm. A referral system is uh, perhaps something you offer to your existing clients that compels them to, keep, to bring other people to you. That's why people develop a loyalty card. Mm -hmm. Loyalty cards are part of the system that makes businesses function better. And of course, in talking about systems again, you need tools that helps you keep track of what you're doing, like a, 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 like a management system, of, like a list management system or a, a email marketing system that helps you to, to put out emails on a regular basis to reach your customers, or even your newsletter can be part of your system. Mm -hmm. Your landing pages can be part of your system. So we're going to use technology as well as old-time marketing efforts in our systems to make it work. Excellent. So if someone was thinking, actually, we need to do some work in terms of our business planning, what yes. might be your suggestions to them as a first step? So if they said, OK, I've got an hour now to start thinking about some key issues, where would you signpost them? OK, are they, are they thinking about their business planning in terms of in, because they want to raise money or do they want to create a plan, a workable business plan that, would, that they can move forward with? Um, let's say a workable business plan to move forward okay. with, because I guess that will support them in raising money if they needed to do that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Because people actually write their business plan simply because they want to raise money, yeah. which, is, which is not a bad thing because at the end of the day, it still gets them to write a business plan. So when I think about a business plan, I always think about a business, and I'm going to give you a format that I'm going to talk you into. When uh -huh. I think about a, business, a business plan has five parts to it. And it's very important that we follow that through, either even in thinking about our own future um, as a business or even in thinking about raising money. So the first part of the business plan is what I call the executive summary. And I've, over the years, I've kind of changed my executive summary to include some things that you know was not in the old format. Things like, you know, what tests have you carried out in your business to assure you that you're going to make sales? That needs to be in the first two pages of that executive summary. What market are you going for? What's your background? You know, how much money do you need? How much sales do you plan to generate? What, what business model do you have that you know is going, to, that is going to work for your business? So you're thinking about those things in those two pages of your plan. So that's that executive summary can act, is actually the most important part of any business plan that investors will also look at. And you also need to, uh, you, you need to reaffirm yourself with the knowledge that you are taking the right steps. Also in those two pages, you will include your management team. I haven't talked today about management team, but that's really important. A management team is a group of people that are going to help you to make your business work. They're gonna give you advice to make your business work. A lot of startups in particular neglect finding someone with the experience to help them in the early stages of their business. And it's so important because people with experience can see the blind spots that you are not aware of. <laughs> and, and they could actually help you for the process. So you need to think about that okay. in those two pages. Then you move on to your marketing plan, which is how are you going to market to your niche and to a larger market? So you're thinking about what kind of social network mediums are you going to use or what kind of adverts are you going to have? Where are you going to promote your product? How are you going to ensure you keep getting referrals or part of the marketing idea? Then the third part is your operations. The operations is the structure of the business. Are you going to move from being a sole trader to a LLC or a company limited by guarantee or a limited liability company? So you're thinking about that. 
What kind of training and development do you need to go through? Then the fourth area is your financials. So I talk to people about developing a cash flow forecast. Somebody says cash is king, and it's true. If your business runs out of cash, then you're in trouble. So you want to develop a cash flow forecast. And I have a cash flow forecast template that anybody can, can, can have if they just contact me that you can use to develop your cash flow forecast and your profit and loss account. Then finally, in your business plan is your appendices. That's where you pad in any kind of information that is too bulky to be placed in the other parts of the business plan. So if you think about those five areas and you're working within those five areas, I think you pretty much will come up with a workable business plan. Excellent. Thank you. And actually, what's, what stands out for me from that, Bumi, is that this is obviously highly relevant for business owners. Mm. But actually, corporate managers would benefit from yes. really taking a step back on occasion and doing their departmental business plans to that format to really think through, um, you know, not just your budgets, but also your yeah. markets and actually who are your who are your key key players. Yeah. Lovely. Um, you, you mentioned the notion of a management team. And because we often talk about leadership in this in this magazine, I was just wondering whether you had any thoughts around what's different about about leading a startup and what might be some key leadership issues that um, that startup owners need to be aware of. OK, if, if, as a startup, you pretty much, you know, Many people who are startups are visionaries. Mm. And in, in, many, in many aspects of leadership and management, a visionaire can be different from a manager. Right. Because a visionaire is always in front, always ahead of everyone else, trying to think about what's going to happen next. Okay, this is where it's given strategic direction to the company. Well, then you need this person here who is going to manage the day-to-day -day activities of the business. Otherwise, it's, going to, it's not going to work. <laughs> so one of the things that I suggest to startup is when you're thinking about a partner, mm -hmm. you've got to think about a partner that complements you. So if I'm a visionaire, I've got to find someone who likes the day-to-day -day management of people, of customers, of clients, of systems, somebody who likes to, somebody who likes to administrate, as opposed to both of us now becoming visionaries. That's why you find partnerships like uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak will mm. work. Yeah. Uh, ben and Jerry, the ice cream people, will work because one of them is a visionary, the other one manages. So that's a, that's a dilemma that every a uh, startup person need to solve. You need to know what are your strengths and what are your weaknesses. That's where you start from. What are the things I'm good at? And what am I going to throw my hands up and say, hey, I need help in this area. So let me get the help that I need so that the business will work well. So those, if, you think about, if you think about that as a starting place, I think it will help a lot of leaders. And the, the, the other two things I would say is every leader needs to continually be in development. You cannot stop reading books. Absolutely. You cannot stop attending seminars. You cannot stop reading magazines or cutting edge information. You need to keep yourself sharp on edge all the time. You've got to be learning all the time because somebody says if you stop learning, you're, then you are dying. All right, but you, you've got to be learning. So if, if a leader is engaged in personal, continuous personal development, What's going to happen is the people they're leading are going to follow that example. And then the third very important factor of leadership is you have to reproduce yourself. There's no point in being a leader that doesn't reproduce. So there's no continuity. Somebody says, do yourself out of a job, <laughs> uh, you know, then that shows that you've actually fulfilled your job. I think there's some truth in that which means that you've got to be developing other people that can take your place. Yeah, 
Excellent. And then it absolutely chimes with our, with some of our views around, particularly um, around looking at your strengths and then helping, getting other people who will, who will complement your strengths uh, with their strengths. Um, and of course, you know, continuous development and developing others are, are, are equally crucial. So yeah. if someone wanted to find out more about um, your work and, and, and get some more advice from you around business planning, where would they go? Yeah, they can go to two places. My website is startyourownbusinessacademy.com. They can find some information there and find me there. Or you can also go to my page on Udemy. You find my page there, which I have about over about 20 courses at the moment on business startups and business growth that somebody can, um, can get hold of. Fantastic. And I really hope that um, that if, if what we've been talking about has resonated with people, particularly around the continuous professional development, then they will take you up on that offer. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you.